Welcome to God's House Tuscaloosa weekly worship videos for June 6th of 2021. I want to offer a thank you to Jackie for her portion in which the prayers, music, and reading of the lectionary for the text today are done. As we prepare now to reflect on the scriptures, let us pray. God of life and love, as we gather together in this time of continued caution during pandemic, we ask that your spirit may dwell in our hearts and teach our minds. We ask that the love of Jesus may guide our words and deeds. And we ask that through our hearing and the help of the spirit, we might grow in your grace, love and service. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our creator, Christ our Savior, and Holy Spirit, our guide and helper. Amen. The family of God. Now, I'm not much on living with an us-them worldview, although I tend to do it sometimes. But this text in Mark might at first appeal to this tendency to seek out those who are like us for companionship and fellowship. We like to be with people who have the same values, who eat the same foods, who dress the same ways and talk the same language as we do. And we feel uncomfortable or don't care much for those who call us disparaging names, who put us down to make themselves look better or refuse to respect our dignity and worth in community. One of Desmond Tutu's key points about the fallacies of apartheid, which is an intrinsic theological truth about racial discrimination in any form or any discrimination at all, is that it denies the humanity and the image of God in another person. It demonizes that which is like God in each of us. This is what Jesus calls blasphemy against the spirit. Not just because it was about himself here in the text in Mark 3, but that it would also blaspheme the spirit in you and me as believers, in whom this same spirit now dwells after Pentecost. Jesus also experienced our own struggles with family. There was a time when his family did not believe in his calling and ministry. They show up here in Mark 3 as his detractors, thinking he's lost his marbles and gone insane. This can cut to the quick to have your own family turn on you. These family messengers are a warning to not assume family support when in the midst of conflict or difficulties. Bloodline is not as strong a love as love and faithfulness to God. So Jesus takes this opportunity to emphasize who you can count on. It's those who are listening, who are seeking understanding, who are open-minded and willing to risk something new as they seek God. These folks are not likely to jump off a cliff if you tell them to, but they're willing to give you a chance to share your truth. And they're willing to walk with you through some stuff in life. They will show you hospitality, love, and respect. They respect your values and believe in you, and they want to grow in their relationship with you. Because we all create communities of people around us, it's part of our human nature. And some are closer than others, like brothers and sisters, like parents or mentors, like children and peers. Some we call friends, and some of these friends are closer than others, who know us from long-term contact and conversations. And these people are likely to be more like us in our spiritual values. And yet each of us has our uniqueness and special quirks and gifts. Yet still we accept and affirm one another in our human worth and value. So while it's wise to be wary of those who do not hold the same values, this is not an external measure that's easily discerned. Some people can be externally very different in appearance and yet very compatible in values. And by the same token, those who look similar to you can hold very different priorities in life than your own. And so in this moment in Mark 3, Jesus looks around him and he sees the religious critics discounting his witness to truth and power. He sees his own family members' unbelief and their undermining actions. I imagine him seeing these folks and sighing a wistful sigh of frustration. Then he turns and looks at those who are coming to him for healing, at the disciples who've accepted his invitation to follow him, 
at the crowd that is eagerly learning and leaning in to hear his words from God. Yes, these are his people, his family, his friends, his circle of support and his field of ministry. Yet this is a circle that is open, not closed. It welcomes anyone and everyone who comes in faith and love. It is the same spirit of acceptance that fell upon the apostles at Pentecost and open the doors of the church to anyone who believes. The world and some in our own families even may look at the diversity in our faith community and ridicule us or think we've gone insane. To call the church or a congregation a family can be risky if the image is one of dysfunction, abuse and tribalism, such as family feuds and rivalries. But what Jesus sees as he looks around him in that moment is a growing love for God that engenders mutual respect for others, especially within the faith community. He sees what Paul later will see budding among the Corinthians, which is an admittedly challenged congregation for diversity. He sees empathy and compassion being expressed amid the difficulties. They see a spirit of generosity and grace growing into peace building. They see a beloved community taking shape in a broken world. Yes, these are his peeps, the people who obey God by living out the meaning of love and growing in this image of God that's in them, an image that is not to be discounted or called unholy. These people and communities are not like the broken ones, those who create divisions that divide people into us and them. Those who create those divisions are built on systems of domination and hierarchy, disempowerment and abuse of others that create enmity between us and them. The attitudes of the naysayers and religious elites in Jesus's day reflect this brokenness and understanding of God's love. Jesus says that such households that such systems of relating are self-destructive. Their fellowships are divided and will fall apart. And we can see how this has been true among religious groups in our own day that are constantly embroiled in internal conflicts and power struggles and spin off divisions. You see, no one really feels safe in these communities for anyone can come in and immediately make us a them instead of an us an unwelcome outsider or a deviant member because of some difference we might have. Rigid rules and doctrines cannot create the bonds of love and trust that are essential for a sustainable and peaceable community. Jesus knows that it's the hunger for God's ways that he sees around him and among his disciples and followers that will build the church up <clears throat> as their many living stones are bound together with the mortar of faith, hope, and love. This is what Israel and his desires for a king failed to understand. Instead of trusting in the love of God, they sought the power and protection of earthly kings. Instead of living the spiritual principles of love and community, they sought to build communal safety on the shifting sands of the whims of human political systems and fragile power structures. But if we recognize the fragility of these earthly structures and turn to the wisdom, strength, and stability of God's ways, then we can be encouraged and have the confidence to trust in God as the psalmist and Paul speak of in their texts. You see, those who follow Jesus in their love for God and others as themselves are those who Jesus calls his family and friends. This does not give us license to fall back into the us-them patterns of relating, it calls us to make room for all of the diversity of humanity in our communities in the bonds of love and mutual respect. Jesus calls us to be open to the power of the spirit, to change the hearts and minds of others and each one of us, not to make us alike, but to teach us how to love one another and how to serve God faithfully. Some years ago, I was having a conversation with another church leader it was right after Jerry Falwell had just done some sort of offensive thing and my friend was commenting 
I don't know if I can live in eternity with the likes of him. In that moment, I remembered another scripture saying, we shall all be changed. And I felt a peace about Falwell, that if his faith is truly the grace of Jesus Christ, then he too will be changed, and so will I. And our differences won't be a problem in eternity. I have known people who've done great harm to congregations that have gone on to work on their own issues and then return to ministry as changed people. If we are too quick to write off all the detractors and naysayers, we might exclude potential members and leaders in the church. I mean, just these stories right here. James, Jesus's brother, came to believe and was a leader in the early church. Paul was the persecutor of the church. Some of the Jewish religious leaders came to believe. Even pagans and irreligious people of different values and cultures, centurions, jailers, tax collectors, Athenian intellectuals and Corinthian sailors, rich business people and poor people, farmers and fisher folk, people like you and me and many who are not. No, once we were all outsiders too. It is the grace of God that has extended to us a, a part in this beloved community. And that grace is also extended to others, to all of the other thems. This love of God is first known to us in a personal relationship, but it always seeks to draw us into the beloved community with others, where all are welcome in God's grace. And then it sends us out into the world with this good news, God loves all of the other yous and thems too. The work of the Spirit transforms both us and the whosoevers that are being saved by God's grace and love. It seeks us to draw us together in unity to serve God in Jesus' name. And then it sends us out into the world to proclaim this good news until all of God's purposes have been fulfilled. Amen. <laughs>